Is it working? It's working. Cool. Now that I can not see, I'll take off my glasses. Oh, I'll keep them on so I can. I don't know. Is that like the dark? Is that like the darkest spot like you could find? It is like pretty dark. Of, if it's not Florida, is it the darkest? Uh, spot in all I didn't Florida? know. Is this dark? I can go out to my car or something. No, you're good. It, is, like, it is dark. I didn't notice that before. I just like picking on you, Bill. Oh, I'm an easy target. How you doing? So, man? How you been? Good, good. How about yourself? I'm well. Uh, I see other people think you look good, so we're good. You know. Okay. Good. Hey, Brad. How you doing? So. Um, well, thanks for joining us. I mean, so you know the gist of this little deal. We're going to talk about uh -huh. chocolate a little bit. We're going to talk about your business. We'll probably talk about some random stuff because you got a baseball story I want to hear. And if something's not, if, if something is not you, what you want to talk about, you just tell me we're not talking about that. And then I'm cool. Okay. That sound good? Uh, that sounds good to me. I'm looking forward to it. Okay. So we're talking with Bill Brown, William Dean. I, it's funny. I got your bio. Right. Yep. And I've never seen you refer to yourself as William Dean before. William I never Dean did. Brown. Never. That like it I tell on a that. box. I tell people that so, I'm like, no, no, I know Bill. In fact, I probably call you Billy when you're not around. Uh, that's what my family calls me. So from way back when. But uh, also, it's our way to know if somebody that comes in the store really knows me. When they insist they went to school with William Dean, they're like, uh, you don't know him because his last name's Brown. Dean's his middle name. But uh, no. Marketing said it looks good, so that's why I'm not that uh, complicated. So Bill works fine. You guys are in Tampa, ish. Yep, sort of. Yep, the we're Tampa on the area. right, just south of Clearwater Beach, uh, Bel Air Bluff. So we're right. I mean, you can walk for about 30 seconds, and you're on the Gulf. So I mean, we're right, right next to the water. So and, never go. And how long? Which the water, or the you know, you don't get to go to the beach. Yeah, I I have maybe the biggest shark phobia in the world. The day I moved here, the front, the lead story was man gets bit into by bull shark, and I was like, that's a good enough signal for me. A pool is just fine. So, but I'll go to the beach. I'll walk. I just don't like getting in. So, I'm writing that down. Shark. <laughs> shark. Oh, hold on, shark. Phobia. I'd add that to your bio. Big time. And people kid me that they they always say, oh, he thinks there's a shark just trolling the waters waiting for him to get in. But I, I am fascinated by him. Like, Shark Week's my favorite time. Uh, but uh, I'll stay on a boat. Like, I'd go in a cage. But I think I would go in a great white but, cage. I'm just not going out there with nothing between us. But see, if you've watched Jaws at all, then you wouldn't even go yes. in a boat. Like, cause, That's, you know, that... Well... That's true. But, uh, you know, we down here, we I didn't think we had big sharks until recently. Now there's 14 foot tigers and even great whites off Clearwater Beach. So another good reason to stay on the sand. So. I, I think this has got like a whole line of chocolates written all over it. Like a little hey, shark. Like, you could get like a shark fin mold, right? It could be like the Bill Brown shark. Well, it, Floridians don't talk about it because it's not a good selling selling point. You know, talking about the shark attacks. They don't make the paper, usually, unless you get bit in half. And then, and then it makes it. And it was kind of Darwinism. I mean, it's a really tragic story, but the, they interviewed the wife afterwards, and she said, well, every day they would go to their dock and jump in the water, and they had noticed that the water was churning up, and he jumped in and landed on the bull shark. And so to me, it's kind of like, if the water's churning in the ocean, I'm not getting in. So, natural, natural selection does two things. It kind of sadly was, but it's um, uh, still tragic. <laughs> so, okay, so you're not a Florida boy because you're afraid of sharks. Yep. But you, if memory serves me, you're from somewhere in the Midwest, Kansas or something. Kansas, right in the Midwest. Center. Chris Elbowville. How'd you end up in so, Florida? When, how and when did you end up in Florida then? Um, about 20 years ago. I was in, I lived in Kansas my really most of my life. And then when I started to get into the technology field, I had the chance to move to Atlanta to, to start a company. And that's what I did. That was in the mid nineties. I moved to Atlanta, uh, mid late nineties and started, joined a, a company that we were doing software and services for recruiting. And that, that was when I left Kansas. And then I was part of the whole dot com bubble with about three different companies. And I just decided, you know what, I don't want to be part of a startup company. And I came down here and went to work for a large business. And then not too long after that, I decided I wanted to do a business again. So 
clear path to chocolate. Like this is exactly the path that I would take, you know, from chocolate. Would never have, if you asked me to write a hundred things down, I do 20 years ago, chocolate wouldn't be on the list. It's, it's pretty amazing. But do you, but do you have like an early, what's like, what's your early food memory? Like what, what's that one memory you have when you're like six that you, you know, still like think about? I do remember we had a, a JC Penney's, I think it was, or Macy's, I don't know which one. And they carried Godiva chocolate. And that gold box, and I'd buy that from my mom, I think mostly for me, but I mean, buy it for her for Mother's Day. And I thought that was like the pinnacle of, of, the, of chocolate. So I did like that, but really, honestly, it wasn't until, um, you know, I'll give a couple people credit here. Norman Love with the G Series, I saw those and I was just amazed, how can you do that with chocolate? And then not too long after that, I by chance had kind of a contact with Chris Elbow and I saw his stuff and I thought, you know, this is such a, uh, a way to be creative, both artistically with the look of the chocolate as a medium and then in, internally with the flavor and just, it just, it just grabbed me. Yeah. I mean, you, your bio talks about an episode of just eats. Yep. That's when I first, um, that's when I wanted to make them. So I, 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 I was making at the time I was actually managing a big department of people, but on the side I would make, little cheesecakes and stuff like that. And, and there was some companies here that wanted to carry them. So I, even though I had no training, I guess they were pretty good. And I saw Alt Brown on Just Eats. I think it's a uh, heart of darkness was the truffle episode. So I thought I'd make some and I thought they were really good. And looking back, there's no way I would even claim anything I made. They were, I'm sure they were horrible, but I just liked the whole, you know, the whole process of working with chocolate. There was, I have a very, uh, math-based family and science was one of my strengths and there's so you know you know there's so much science to chocolate that you know it's really good for nerds who think they're artists so i think that's what kind of pulled me in so i was i i was trying to come up with like my snarky response there and i had nothing like i was like I, that's <laughs> that, that pause was like that you set me up for a snarky response and i just don't have one well you, know? you have not enough caffeine today i guess been one of so. those days or well you know so it's funny the, the one thing you did say like i wouldn't claim the first thing that i did right like i think about that too like when i went back to culinary school like i mean i had to make a cake you know in this competition and i you know i practiced for like a week and like i made this cake and my wife was like my now my ex-wife but my wife at the time you know does this whole thing about like this is great it's wonderful and you know they kicked the snot out of me. Like the judges were like, this isn't very good. And like, I'm like, yeah. no, I, I disagree. You don't know how hard I work. But I think, you know, we get better at what we do because we, we, we practice, right? I mean, when we're doing it every day, you know. And I, and I think some people, if you're, if you're kind of, you know, I hate the term perfectionist because I don't think I ever hit it. But I think if you kind of expect the best, you never quite hit the mark. You know, I, you know, to going back to baseball, a grand slam was about the only perfect at bat, you know, and when it comes to food, unless, I think unless, unless, it's, stuff. unless it's at three balls and no strikes and then, and then it's bad form. Well, yeah. And you're winning by a lot, but, uh, I got, but, yeah. whole, but I, I got the whole debate on Facebook this week about that play about like unwritten rules of baseball. And I'm like, no, he, like he's lying. He saw the, he, he knew the signs. Uh, gross. My answer would be throw more strikes because most like most of the time people pop those up. But uh, but anyway, you know when you were what you were talking about, I think some of the people that I really respect in the industry that I, that I know, I think they always look at what they finished and a lot of times you're proud of what you did, but you you see more you could do. Like it's not it's not a hundred percent very often somebody goes perfection. I, you know, I there's nothing better I can do. And I think that's a good attitude to have is that there's always room for improvement. I think the challenge though, is accepting that we can make something that's really good. And it, it, I think there, there, there's not perfect. Like, I don't believe that there's perfect anymore in my life. Right. I mean, there there's, not, there's not perfect in my kitchen. There's not perfect in any of those places, but that doesn't mean that if it's not perfect, it's garbage. Right. I mean, absolutely, I think, you're right. And, and I think that's a really hard, I think for, culinarians and perfectionist culinarians i mean that that line is really fine you know i mean you again i'm going to reference your bio because i have it in front of me because mm -hmm. i actually printed it today like right um uh -oh. you know so you reference you know 
some people that I've worked very closely with. And one of those is Anil Rohira, right? And Anil used to tell mm -hmm. us that, like, hey, you know, I can teach anybody to do pastry, right? Which is a little insulting in some levels, but, you know, I mean, like, short of any, you know, any, any monkey can do pastry, right? But we also knew that the, the trash can was there for a reason, right? Like the bin, like there were times where we were going to throw stuff out because it wasn't right. Um, you know, and so I think that getting that recipe right or getting the, that finish right or that the right mold or what, or whatever it is, is important. I'm not, I'm not saying it's not important, but we're not going to, we're not going to, we're not going to bat a thousand and, and nobody, and we shouldn't, we're, nobody is right. I mean, there are people that are closer to it. Right. Well, and I think what you'll find are the people that, uh, I'll name drop some, but uh, like uh, Nathaniel Reed, who's a good friend of mine. Nathaniel's not one when you compliment him, just soaks it up. You know, like he he almost brushes, you know, the, the people that are really good kind of brush it off because that's not what they're looking for. And they still see, you know, that that two or three percent. They do acknowledge that they're doing something good. Um, you know, my my Kansas City background, Pat Mahomes, if you watch him, he's phenomenal. And yet when he talks, it's almost as much about what he didn't do right. Uh, as opposed to the things he did that no other quarterback has done. So, um, you know, I think I think it's a good aspiration, but you do have to at some point say, you know, this stuff is, sir, you know, we're doing a good job. Like we make a lot of chocolates. We can't we only pull out the perfect one out of, you know, one out of 32 or we'll be out of business in a hurry. So there's there's a level you have to be comfortable with. To well, yeah, I mean, it's but it's setting an expectation. Right. I mean, I think that we that I think one of the things that is is evident in premium Let's anything. See if I can get more light. No, not That's really. Right. Pre premium anything, right? So forget chocolate. You know, food. Yeah. You know that we can raise that expectation, and our and our and our customers raise that raise that expectation for us as well, and we have to maintain it, mm -hmm. right? But as long as we maintain it, we meet the expectation. Right, it's when we fall below that line that it gets really hard, right? Or it gets, think, our customers get upset with us. When you go into business, no matter what widgets you're making or chocolate, I think it all really depends on what's your focus. Are you going to be? Are you going to? Are you going to make uh, you know Maseratis? Or are you going to make Fords? And it's the same with chocolate. There are companies that maybe don't shoot as high, but they make a lot of chocolates. They do a good job, but you know, it's not it's not the piece you eat, and you're like, wow, that was kind of a, a transcendent moment. I've never had those flavors, right. and it was, and and so we kind of when I started the company, I thought, you know, I really want to target the top probably ten percent of wage earners. Not that that doesn't mean other people don't buy it, but I wanted people who insist on quality, who who um, you know don't get um, sticker shocked by the price of the chocolates, and and I'm fortunate to be in that kind of an area where most of our customers, I mean, they have the means and they don't bat it up. Well, one person told me, oh, you have those chocolates that are $1.85 a piece or $1.75 a piece at the time. Like it was so expensive. She's, you know, worth a couple hundred million dollars. But I mean, um, you know, so when you, when you start your business, I think you have to have a clear goal of, you know, what is it you want to do? Is that what you want to do for the long term? Like it's always for me a temptation we've had opportunities to maybe do higher production, but maybe lower cost. And I just, it's just not why I quit my job. Okay. So let's, let's get back to quitting your job. So you, 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 you're now in Florida. Mm -hmm. The bull sharks are, are my, <laughs> they're safe. They're not going to have any food for me. And you're making cheesecakes on the side. And yep. we saw, we see this Alton Brown episode and, you wake up in the middle of the night like, hey, I can do that? Or like, how did, what, how did that You know, it, wasn't, it, it, it started kind of uh, just, you know, I would work probably, I would say 60, 70 hours a week at least. I mean, I was there at 5, 5.30 in the morning when nobody else was there till 8. Because I liked my job. It wasn't, you know, which was fortunate. I liked my job. I liked the opportunity to prove myself. And... But, there, you know, this was what kind of fueled me when I wasn't working. I would be dreaming at night of, you know, combinations and things like that. And um, it just, I think my whole life I was looking, you know, for what really made me passionate and happy. And I never, you know, work I, I poured myself into. 
you know, something like baseball, yeah, everybody wants to be a professional, but that's such a hard, you know, you can't even be a bad pro. They have to, you have to be good enough that they say they want you, or, you know, anybody can open a chocolate company, no matter what kind of product you put out, and then time will tell whether you survive. So I think that's what happened was I, I felt like for almost for the first time, I found kind of what really inspired me. And so I was, I felt lucky because I had a good job and I didn't hate it. I liked working with people, but I, it just, I couldn't resist doing this. And, and everything fell in place. I was supposed to train with a local chocolatier who had, you know, probably the kind of chocolate shop you'll see in any town you go into. It's, it's nothing spectacular. It's decent. Um, and I signed up for a class and she said, called me and said, well, why are you taking the class? And I said, I just love this. And I'm actually thinking maybe I'll start a business. And she said, well, I don't teach competitors, so you can't take my class. And so I, I didn't know what to do. I Googled and I see the Nodder School and I thought, okay, that's not too far away. And then I called and I actually got to talk to AWOLD for the first time. And I thought, you know, it's out of my league really to even think of doing that. I didn't have a chef jacket or pants. And I remember the first class I took was with Andrew Schatz. And when I went there, I almost left because I felt like a fool because I, I just didn't fit. Everybody else was instructors. And at lunch, Awald came to me and said, you know, how do you think it's going? And I said, I, I think I'm over my head. He said, you know, because he'd been watched. And he said, Bill, you have so much passion for this. Your questions, you're asking questions that these people, you know, don't, you know, you, you're, you're in the right place. Your passion will, will carry you. And that really, he's been somebody who I really feel like probably more than anyone kind of set me up for, you know, where we're at today because of that encouragement. Yeah, I mean, Awald, I mean, I mean, you know, Awald weaves his way through my story too, you know, and, uh -huh. and, and both working for AUI for a while and getting to know him in my first professional class was at the, was at his school in Gaithersburg. And, you know, I mean, he is, I mean, he, he is this guy that has like, he's forgotten more about like sugar and chocolate than I know. Like, I mean, you know, and, and he definitely has, he has more skills. He's forgotten more skills than I have. How's that? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we could, we could probably to go throw to throw on technology, but like, you know, he, he's known how to, he's forgotten how to do more stuff, recipes than, than I've but ever done. He's a good example of the perfection we talked about. He's yeah. probably the best and he's so humble. It doesn't, you know, gloat about anything he does. And I, that actually means as much to me as the skills he has. It's just his attitude about what he does. Yeah. And I, humbleness. Sometime off off air, we'll talk some Awald stories. Though I mean, Awald, I mean, <laughs> he, I mean, he is that Swiss German perfectionist, right? I mean, yes. and I think, and I think that when, when he 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 and I joked about this recently. Like, you know, he's definitely different than he was twenty years ago. How's that? Like, age smooths the edges on all of us a little bit. You know, I mean, and I he's doing he's, production. I mean, today, but. Production, yeah. when you're in a production environment, it also changes from an artistic or maybe a teaching environment. Uh, no, I, I don't mean it's changed. I don't even mean that it's changed his perfectionism for the oh, okay. that's being made. I mean, it's just he, he's less inclined to yell at you in Swiss German. Oh, well, I never got that, so I was lucky. I was a paying yeah, customer. See, yeah, right. <laughs> so, so I always saw, only saw the, the great side of him, and that's how I'll always remember him. So you take the class with Andrew Schatz and AWOL inspires and says, you should go forward with this. And you come back to Tampa and you quit your job and you open a chocolate business? Pretty well. I took about two or three classes with some different people. And then what happened was, you know, I, I you know, I, like as I said, I moved to Atlanta to start basically three different companies I was part of. And it was a lot of highs and lows. I mean, I remember flying to Phoenix for lunch and L.A. for dinner. And, you know, it was kind of cool for a while. But ultimately, it ended in failure because, you know, the, the dot-com bubble burst. And I really was hoping when I did this chocolate business, I, I really thought it was important to have my family, you know, particularly my parents and stuff, supporting it because they were going to be the first investors anyway. And my mom, you know, in five years at Serrati and I had gotten five promotions and you can only get one promotion a year at most. So I was doing well. And um, so we went to Dean and DeLuca in Kansas City and they had, they happened to have a big Dean and DeLuca in Kansas City, looked at the chocolate case and 
you know, I was trying to convince her that I could do this. And she asked how much they were. And I think the time they were, were $60 a pound. And my mom's reaction was, well, nobody's going to pay that much. And the girl behind the counter said, we can't keep them in stock. And my mom, who was trying to talk me out of it, immediately said, his are better than that. So they asked me to bring them to the store. So we went home, brought them. And by the time I got to my parents' house, they called and said, we want to carry you in two stores. So that's really what did it. And it took a couple months for it, you know, for the, the store in North Carolina and Kansas City uh, to open up for me. And then I just, when they said, look, we want to buy your chocolates, I just told my boss, I, I guess I'm quitting. And, uh, you know, so, um, you know, it, it was the right time. I mean, I the, the bad thing was I left a lot of uh, stock that would have come my way on the table, but that's okay. Um, it, it was it was the moment I needed to, you know, sometimes you have to act or not act. And if I'd waited, I don't think it, we'd be in the same place we are. Um, and, you know, Dina DeLuca was a great first customer to have. So when was that, like 2010? 2007, 2008. So we're, we've been almost 13 years now. I mean, we were a business in 2007 and eight. Not that anybody would know it. I mean, I, I, you know, a big day here was a couple hundred dollars, you know, and I was like high five. And so we, we were, and my brother has a, he's a, an accountant. He has his own uh, accounting firm. And he said, Bill, for the first year, don't even try to make money. Just make a product people want. So it was nice to have that backing that said, look, we don't need to be profitable right away. Let's make it right. Yeah, but that's dollars, right? I mean, I think if we look at, you know, business-wise, that, that's, that's even more risk on the table, isn't it? I mean, we got to keep the doors open, and we're not worried about making any money, but we're spending money. I mean, if, well, if, if, we, 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 you know, I was in a position where I probably didn't need, I didn't, I don't even know that I took a real salary the first year, but a lot of people go into a small business with the need, they've got their projections and in six months, they're going to be doing 2 million. We knew we didn't care if we made any money the first year, we had enough yeah. money to keep us afloat. And the most important thing was to develop a product that people really wanted. And I, I think that was wise and we were in a position to do it and right. you know a lot of things just lined up for us too we worked yeah. hard but. but but there's a fine line there too right i mean like somewhere along the way i in the wayback machine when i when i between roles here at tomrick you know i did some consulting and i and i remember a conversation that i had with one of my customers and they were taking a business that they were making in their basement right they turned their basement into a officially licensed place in the state they were in um and then they were getting a retail spot and they're doing all this stuff. And we start to do the math, right? And I'm like, okay, cool. Are you paying yourself rent in the basement? And the answer was no. I'm like, okay, so now, you know, you're going to move to this no rent environment to you're now going to have to pay a thousand dollars a month. I'm sure it was more than that, but whatever. Let's just, for the sake of the argument, it's a thousand dollars a month. Mm -hmm. Are you paying yourself at all? No. Okay. You're a one person operation here because you don't have a retail counter and all this stuff. So now, now you're gonna have to pay somebody 40 hours a week, right? So that dollar figure, sure you're making money in that other environment or you're making a little bit of money, but now you've got to generate that revenue to be able to support that business. And so if the argument is, hey, I don't need to take, any, I don't need to take a dollar out of this business for a year, that's okay. But that, there's a cost, that, but, but the growth pattern has to, at some point you've got to start paying yourself back for that. Absolutely. We, we went in with that idea, but, um, you know, a lot of, you know, my brothers, he, he, uh, works with so many businesses that he basically was just saying, let's not have pie in the sky expectations. Like, you know, most people when they do business plans have huge profits within six months and you just, you can't control that. So we, we were pretty confident because of, uh, where we were located and I'd had, I'd done some chocolates that I didn't sell and there was demand here. So we knew that. Um, but right. yeah, it's in, you know, I've tried over the, I see that somebody mentioned e gullet. That's also, that's really where it all began. I still sometimes go back to my first post so I can, I think I'm too big for my britches. I realized I didn't even know what tempered chocolate meant, but I, I was online with e gullet and, uh, that's really where I, I learned a lot, um, from going to their fo online forums and it, it was a great, resource for me but you know as far as the business you're right you can't it's either going to be a hobby or a business and there's a lot of hard factors like 
your location, if it's your passion and you're in a place that's just not going to support it, it doesn't matter how passionate you are. Yeah, I mean, and that's another one of my lines and, you know, um, about, and somebody asked a question about, are you always in the same location? And we'll get right back to that. But, you know, I can give you a hobby that costs you $25,000 a year. And it'll, oh, be a absolutely. Great, it'll, it'll be a great hobby. And, you and you'll love it. Weekend, and you'll love it. But there's a dollar figure associated with that hobby, mm -hmm. right? And that's okay, too. Like, I don't, I don't, like, you know, people get asked me that question. I get asked the question all the time about, you know, people that are on Instagram and, you know, they're making chocolate, but they're not doing it professionally. And how do I feel about that? I'm like, look, I play squash, right? Squash costs oh, wow. me something, right? Like squash costs me X number of dollars a year. I love playing squash. I don't care mm -hmm. that it costs, my wife cares, but I don't care that it costs me this many dollars a year. So if you love making chocolate and you don't need to sell it or you don't want to sell it, that's okay too. Yeah. Right? Like I think, or whatever it is, you know, cheesecakes or bread or yeah. I like cooking steak every Saturday, you know, like then put the, put the oven in in your house and do it the way, you know, the Peter Luger way. That's cool. But no, you're not going to be able to sell it. Right? Well, I had a good friend of mine um, who's very successful, you know, a pharmacist. He had his own business. And, and he really gave me the, the advice I think that was important. He said, Bill, find something you love to do and find a way to get paid for it. And that's how you'll be happy. And I thought, you know, he didn't say find a way to get rich. And that's the big difference. You don't have to get rich. If, you're, if you feel rich in what you do, um, it just depends on your goal. If you want to be rich, it may not be the right option. You know, you could have stayed in Kansas City and worked for Hallmark and done greeting cards, Bill. That yes. wasn't appropriate. I was way too um, – well, my time in Kansas City was not full of a lot of mature thought. I was still yeah. playing games and, you know, I, I just I, – nothing to take to my head that, oh, at some point you have to earn a living. I was just getting – you know, I was just enjoying life. So. Okay, so, so quick question. Have you always been where you are? What do you mean? William Dean Chocolates. Has that always been in the same place or have you moved? In well, we moved. We had a small location for about four years and then we moved here – nine years ago. And uh, so we've been here for quite a while. Um, it's and, longer than uh, that, I bet. When was I there? I haven't been there in years, Bill. So I got to come visit. Oh, you, you, you were here. Well, I didn't see you because I kept getting called the Home Shopping Network, if I remember right. Fancy, like I fancy, spent about a minute. No, I mean, I, I, I planned on spending time with you and I was back and forth, but probably I six did, or seven years know, ago. I don't know if I ever told you, I dropped your hair dryer in the, in the tempering unit. Oh, cool. That's what happened. No, well, I, went uh, buy, I went and bought you a new one. I went across the street to Walgreens. I bought you a new one. I just plugged it in because Jamie it, came I to felt, the shop. I remember because I was so looking forward to you coming down, and then they had some special weekend, and they kept calling me over to not really do anything because I was no, you know, I was a fill a slot person. I wasn't somebody that made money. Uh, but you're, I remember thinking your feedback was so good. You know, even if even when it wasn't. You know, the best feedback isn't always what you want to hear. I mean, you didn't say anything really bad, but I remember I you got my staff time. together and read them the riot act about uh, these machines cost more than my house. You need to take better care of them. And that that really made an impact on them. Hey, I know those. Well, yeah. except one. Yeah, somebody ate it. I don't know. Somebody oh, was in the kitchen. Like, probably like, somebody you know, here. No, it was here. So. I watched them do it. But anyway, so Bill, Bill very generously sent us – like a care package this week, which is kind of cool. But I mean, so that's one box. But so chocolate, you started with chocolate. Yeah. Right. These boxes, by the way, are beautiful. Magnetic. And, beautiful. I, and I felt that was a part of our brand. But, yeah. But you've grown, Bill. Like everything's backwards. But, you know, there's a, a mm -hmm. nice assortment of Patafui, and you guys are panning now, too. I mean, you know, I think. Thanks, Tom Rick. Well, I wasn't fishing. I wasn't fishing. I know. Tell me. But, I, um, I love it. You know, and Bill, and full disclosure, I mean, Bill and I know each other really well because Bill was one of the first, um, first real embracers of Sell Me um, in North America, one of our very first cooling tunnel installations, which is probably why I was there. So that's a great question. How many people do you have on staff these days? Well, right now, it's not a really good indicator, but it right. usually runs between 15 to 20, and then maybe over the holidays, it goes up a little more. And of course, a lot of those people are, our um, retail, but uh, um, we have a new person starting in September, I believe, from Italy. 
Bill's out of so, there. Fancy piece of equipment. So, for, uh, uh, so uh, but yeah, I mean, I, uh, I, I had, I think five full-time people in the kitchen. So we're still not a big company, uh, but you know, we, we do some production. Are you there every day? Yeah. Pretty much. I'm pretty much there here every day. Um, a, f a few years ago, I was kind of told to not be as active day to day because I needed to be doing other things. And they, and they, they wanted the kitchen to know, and it's probably the same with some of the others. Um, he'll be, he'll do the creative stuff and all that, but Bill's a luxury when he's working in the kitchen. You guys need to be able to do this without his production. Until, I do the, all era of, until the era of COVID. And now you're in the production kitchen. Every well, day. I was. I was having a blast for the first couple months. I was making eclairs and practicing new things. But uh, uh, we actually were busy in our first month. So we had to, we had to get everybody back and get production going again. Uh, so you, I, mean, but it's but, down. But, I mean, the retail side isn't, I mean, it's obviously important. I mean, COVID hit Valentine's Day and Easter, right? Yep. I mean, well, didn't really killed, hit Valentine's Day. Killed Easter. Day. Killed Easter for us. But – but I mean, you do. I mean, your internet online business has got to be a big punch portion of your business anyway. Like it's got to it, be more than it half. keeps growing. But I don't. Oh no. Oh really? Uh, the big honestly, the biggest part of our business is our direct to retail people. Again, we're in one of the wealthiest zip codes in the country, so that doesn't hurt. It's kind of right. it's kind of like Beverly Hills without all the glamour. Just up the road, you know, it's Hulk Hogan and you know. It's it's pretty wealthy, so yeah. Like Hulk Hogan and Glaber don't like go in the same. Set. No, but I mean, but, he, you know, he when when he was at the top of his game, he was pulling in some bucks. But um, we have people come in and they'll spend a thousand dollars on chocolate, and it's not that unusual. Uh, but that's not what I do for Christmas. I don't buy a thousand dollars of chocolates for people at the office. So that's actually half of our business is just direct to people in the store. But our internet's growing. Um, we kind of reached across. Crossroads and, on. Go ahead. And there's gelato. Yep, our gelato's continually growing. So we we what I did was my commitment to my employees was look if I hire you full time for, at Christmas you're gonna have a full time job every month of the year. And as you know, chocolate goes way down in the summer. So I had to come up with things that would keep us going. So we do gelato. We do afternoon tea, which has been really popular. Um, I had just started to roll out a, a, a breakfast program. I just bought this big giant espresso machine. Haven't sold a single cup of coffee with it because COVID hit. But you know, so I'm always looking at, uh, and, and, you know, and I'm also thinking, what do I, where do I want the business to be in five years? And I, when I started, I thought, oh, I want, uh, you know, ten at William Deans around the country. I think right now I'm pretty happy with just being kind of a local business that's well known that embraces the community. And we'll hit, we'll, you know, we'll f we'll find our niche and we'll just stay in that niche and just, you know, I I'm okay with that. I don't need to have a store in New York and L.A. Not that I wouldn't, but right now that's not what I'm looking for. And you're right about the Internet. That's something, it's grown organically for us. We've, we've employed PR firms, but we need to do some work to get that even better. But it, it, it's way up this year, um, I think, because of COVID. Uh, but. You know, so we've been fortunate compared to a lot of businesses. But did you do, I mean, did, I mean, you're in Florida, so the rules are a little different. But, I mean, did you have to do, like, curbside and all that stuff? Or were you? Um, well, How in Florida, it means you don't follow any rules. But uh, uh, we did do curbside for a while. And then now we have the store open. But, you know, it's the mask required. And we won't let them in if they don't. And six-foot distance. So we, we have a decent amount of, of business day-to-day. Um, but we don't serve gelato. We don't do pastries. There's don't do afternoon tea. We're just selling chocolate. So, and, and yeah, as you know, um, August isn't the best chocolate month of the year anyway. So right. if it's going to hit, hopefully it clears up. My, my, our, my concern, I'm sure the concern of, you know, a lot of the other people on this call is what's December going to be like, you know, cause Christmas is a make or break holiday for chocolate companies. Right. It's a huge percentage of our, of what we do. And yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, get out your crystal ball, right? I mean, I think that's the hard part about all this. You know, it, we're having those same conversations internally about what do we do for next year and when do we start our class program again? Speaking of which, somebody asked when you're starting classes again. Yeah, we do a lot of classes. Uh, compliments of Tim Brown, you know, uh, our good friend from Johnson and Wales. He usually does 30 or 40 classes a summer here. 
And uh, we just, it, we can't do it because it's too many people in a, a confined area. So he's, he's awesome at it. And, you know, I'll do, I'll help him on some, the things I'm passionate about, I'll help with, but you know, he's a really good friend of mine and I love having him down here. And I think he, he does an incredible job, you know, when he teaches. So he's got, he's got, I think they're asking when Tim, when's Tim going to be here more than when, when are we going to do classes? But I try to be optimistic about the future because um, I do think that, you know, normal's going to come back at some point. Um, you know, I, I don't think restaurants forever are going to be at 50% occupancy, um, but it's hard when you're in that tunnel kind of to see the light, of, you know, what, when the light at the end of the tunnel is going to arrive. Um, I hope it's before December, though, but, uh, or it doesn't get worse. If it stays this way, um, corporate sales are a huge part of our business at Christmas. I mean, probably half of our, our Christmas sales are corporate now. And, you know, so I hope that that'll be there. I, I think it will be, but, you know, all you can do is, you know, kind of approach every day with a positive attitude and, and uh, you know, be smart about it. So. So some nuts and bolts questions. Someone just asked and it's a good segue. Um, one brand of chocolate or the one brand of chocolate. You can tell me that you're not going to answer it. Well, too. you know me pretty well. So I, I am uh, a pretty loyal Valrona customer. So you right now. Too. That was in the goodie bag too, by the way, everybody. Bill, I know you would, I knew you'd like that. Possibly it's amazing. The most, possibly the most expensive chocolate on the planet. It's pretty I good think. though, isn't it? It was delicious. And I'm, like the raspberry is actually really good too. It's strong. It tastes like raspberry sorbet. So I've loved, I've loved my relationship with Valrona. We're pretty much about 99.9% .9 Valrona now. I do use Ruby, which I, when I first heard about it, thought, oh, it's just, a, you know, it's a nice story. But we have one chocolate that when I used it in that, on that bonbon, it improved it. So a raspberry, white chocolate raspberry, it made it so much better. So that's the only chocolate right now. But I love Felkland as well. So, I mean, there's, there's times where we've been more Falkland than Valrona, but you know, over the 13 years, I mean, Eric Case was with me right at the beginning, and um, he's, I'm he's with you right he's, now. Uh, yeah, well, he's on your so I saw. as much as the chocolate, it's the people that that sell you on the. Uh, and of course, you now I know he's not. Now he's Falkland, so maybe. But he's not Falkland anymore, by the way. Oh, I'm I, I'm not keeping up, but uh, anyway, I I. I think when it comes to what chocolate you use, um, I always say, hey, there he is. I tell people, um, you know, I, I, I speak highly of Valrona and Falcon. I'm like, to me, they're kind of like if they were cars, they're the Mercedes, BMW, pick your poison. They're both high quality, smaller production. They're not, you know, I drive a Honda. Uh, there's Hondas out there that people use and can make good chocolates. But at the end of the day, no matter what skills you use and what creative flavors you come up with, it's the chocolate, I think, that makes the difference. That's the last taste in your mouth often is, you know, the dark, especially the dark chocolate. White chocolate, maybe less so, but dark chocolate and milk chocolate, uh, you, you got to start with a good ingredient to get a good product. I think you do with everything, right? I mean, uh, yeah. back, to that, back to that perfectionist conversation. I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to get too deep in the weeds on it again but you know i mean ingredients matter right and, mm -hmm. and i think that it what we people food people should be buying the best ingredients that they can afford and and that that that's a big caveat right the best ingredients you can afford for whatever the product is you're going to sell right and i'm with you i don't think I, I, I think there are chocolates that are less expensive, that are more value priced, um, that would not afford themselves to your products as well, that they would not show the other decisions you make about the purees you use and those types of things. But that doesn't mean that those other things don't have a home too. You know, I mean, you know me, I know, I know all the, I work with all the chocolate companies in North America, right? And so, sure. so we, you know, we sell equipment that works with $3 a pound chocolate and we sell equipment that works with $20 a pound chocolate. And, and um, I think that's important to note that, that there, there's the right place for $3 a pound chocolate. You know, there's the right Absolutely. market for $3 a pound chocolate. And it doesn't, $3 a pound chocolate doesn't get you a fancy box necessarily, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's not well-crafted and, and people care. You know what I mean? Oh. Like, 
you know. I'm very I'm passionate. No, I'm just saying I'm very passionate. We have, I think, a really good U.S. chocolate company. You, yeah. e, I think I think e Guitar is excellent, and I don't think it gets the. And I'm just going to say I don't think they get the the props they deserve. Um, I just happen to have this relationship with Valrona because it's I I love the product, right. the support I get with classes. But you know, when I look at like our passion fruit chocolate, which is a white chocolate with passion fruit, it probably really doesn't make a big difference what white chocolate I use because you're not going to taste white chocolate; you're going to taste passion fruit. But I just, for consistency purposes, stick with you know Valrona. When business wise, yeah, probably would make more sense if if the white chocolate's really just supplying cocoa butter and maybe some creaminess. You you, you it's not like a, a bonbon where the the chocolate itself is is really pronounced. So. Uh, but I just, I, I like, I get happy when I put my Valrona uh, chocolate up in the shelves when, I, when it gets here. It makes me feel good. So, or, or Felkman, it doesn't matter. I mean, I, I like, I, I want to go with the brands that I think um, speak to me for the quality that I want to give. And, and those two are the ones that I, there's others out there for sure that are just as oh, yeah. good. But those are the ones that, that I've worked with, I've had success with, and I've got relationships with those companies and I, I think that goes a long way too, right? I mean, you know, I've been on that side of the supply chain too. And, you know, I worked for a brand that we were very expensive and the expectations were definitely higher, right? The expectations on our consumer were higher. Look at that. Chris Kohler just joined us. He's hey, a punk. Chris. punk. But anyway, I mean, like the expectations as the price ticket goes up on the, on the per pound, the expectations on what we were expected to provide to, you know, to you, you know, as the user – went up as well. Hey, and, I, and I think those are some things that you have to keep in mind about that. And decision. I expect that. I honestly expect that. I mean, it's funny, Chris is there and Brett, we were all in the same class in France. I don't probably eight years, 10 years ago. And so those are relationships that I've kept, but those were, again, I look at Valrona brought us together, but you're right. I expect more when I pay more and right. they've delivered. So, you know, you, 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 you decide whether, you know, the, the purees, I've kind of gone around. It just really depends on what, like right now I have some really interesting ones that are unique, you know, that you just don't, you know, you don't see. So I'm, you know, I, I'm not going to get into brands as much, but that, that may change. But as long as it's of similar quality, if it's in the same range, I, I don't, I don't really care whose name is on the label. Right. Except well, I'd I mean, rather. But that's your car argument, right? Like I'm a Toyota guy. Like I've been driving Toyotas. And before that, honestly, before that I was a Volvo guy, but, but I'm a Toyota guy because, you know what, I don't want to spend, like, I'm, I'm okay with the fact that the dealer doesn't have a car rental for me when I go because I only have to go twice a year, right? Versus if I was, if I'm driving that Mercedes, you better take me home. Like, if I'm dropping the car off for service, somebody better get my butt to work today. Cause and, and when you're somebody that's manufacturing something, if you don't feel a strong sense of brand loyalty to the raw ingredients you get, then you're, right. you're not making a good choice because you should think I'm picking the best because I want to make the best. So I, I, you know, some of that is, um, I think it's, I mean, I think for me, it's real. I'm, ha I'm happy with the chocolates we've used over the years, but yeah. um, it's, I know that's always one of your questions and there, there are, you know, there's a, um, there's a, but I agree with you. There are a lot of great chocolates out there that maybe don't get ranked the way they should because the quality is just as good, but uh, you know, and, I, and I've used all of them. Oh, and I'm not saying that. I'm just, I just think, that, yeah. like, I think what you've got to, like, again, back to my consulting days, picking a chocolate yep. always comes down to flavor, workability, and price, right? Yep. And there, I think what we're talking about is there's also this piece about service, right? And so if we take that out, if I don't care what it costs, I can get all the mm -hmm. workability and flavor I want, right? But if, if I have to, if I'm worried about the cost figure because – whatever reason for finished goods, my consumer, whatever, then I do have to start making choices, right? I've got to make choices mm -hmm. about like, you know, what do I need? And then we also make choices based on proximity. And then we make choices on like, okay, I'm already carrying everything from this brand. So now like they're going to get my white chocolate too. Right. So yeah. yeah, it's a dollar more a pound and it might not be as good, but they're getting my white chocolate because I'm bringing it in by the pallet anyway. And to the bottom, I like El Rey. I think El Rey is one of those. It's the El first Rey's chocolate I ever used. I love it. El Rey is one of those brands that 
has this little niche in North America, but it's not widely used. And for a lot of reasons, and, right? And the other component when you're, I think, I think you really have to be serious when you run a chocolate business, if you just change, you can't, you can't change chocolates out without changing recipes. Right. Yeah. And true. so some people do that because one's cheaper, but then you don't get the same results. So that's the other thing is once you get so attuned, I guess, to what you're using, um, you know, you're happy with it. It works well. You've got everything configured for it. Um, you know, so I don't think you can just exchange one chocolate for another. Oh. Taste-wise, you can, but not, you know, not from a science perspective. I, I don't Very think taste wise, not even taste wise necessarily, right? I mean, I think there's there's the people that like that chocolate, your chocolate, right? Know what it tastes like, you know, the same yeah. way that. Look, I'll be honest. I haven't had a Big Mac, by the way, in like 15 years. It. I saw that Super Size Me movie, right, and yeah. decided I was never eating a McDonald's again. Um. So I haven't had a Big Mac in 17 years, right? And and I still know what it tastes like. And my bet is, uh -huh. if I were to walk into McDonald's today, having not been in a, big, in a McDonald's for 17 years, that Big Mac would taste exactly the same way that I remember it tasting from 17 years ago. And I, and I think our customers expect that our chocolates are going to stay the same. That raspberry, pure, that raspberry chocolate, whatever it is, that raspberry caramel, is going to be the same raspberry, raspberry caramel that they had five years ago. And, and they're going to remember it that way. And it's important because when you're an upscale chocolate company, like a lot of the, my friends I see on here, um, you have a reputation that, you know, maybe one of your customers brags about you and shows you off and they don't want to come in and all of a sudden it's like, eh, you know, you've decided to make some changes to make more money. It's not the same product they were, you know, bragging to their friends about. And uh, so, you know, um, I always appreciate the people that don't lose that focus that, you know, that come in with um, the attitude of I'm going to make great chocolates. And I look at them five, 10 years later, their chocolates are the same. And we order all the time here. I'll order from a select number of chocolatiers. And then I have my staff eat them. And I say, this is the level of quality we have to be at. These are the people, a lot of them are on the, on the, on the call, that I think do a great job. And, you know, if you're wowed by them, but not by us, we're not doing something right. So we have to keep ourselves at this level. And then sometimes I'll slip somebody new in and they're, they're like, oh, I don't really like that one. But that's good. They, you know, your quality has to be your quality. Right. Right. But it's also about, about, you know, choices in the box, right? I mean, like you, you've had some same recipes for the entire time you've been in business. Absolutely. And then yep. you've also had recipes that are new and, and trying new things. So that's, a, so this has been great, Bill, but we're running short on time. So oh, that's like, okay. I got like two or three things that I want to ask because I'm just curious. Okay, I'll sit back. Like, so the first one is, that recipe you thought was going to be the one that everybody loved that they're like, this is garbage. Like, what do you think of, what was that recipe? Well, one that uh, I thought would be great was butternut squash with coconut and curry. And uh, it should have worked because what happened was I had soup and I loved it. And I thought, well, I'm going to convert that. And I remember Tim was down and he tried it. He's like, what are you thinking? And, um, it wasn't bad by any, but it was so different. But I remember talking to Donald Russell and I told him about it and I said, it's the same thing as a pumpkin. Why are people butternut squash? And he said, you're right. He said, when somebody learns in the pastry world, they learn the boundaries and butternut squash is outside the boundaries of a ganache. Yeah. In so, your defense, in your defense though, I did one year for Tom Rick's like fall, like, uh -huh. off, right. Like I did a, um, squash and marshmallow and i'm like it's exactly it it tastes right it tastes exactly like pumpkin pie and everyone here was like no brian no yeah. that's a really bad idea and it's a good lesson that you you don't make stuff for yourself or even for other chefs you make it for a customer a consumer and right. that's just too out there for a consumer for most consumers a few loved it but i couldn't afford to make it for those few so that was <laughs> that was kind of and it was it wasn't that was probably the worst and it taught me to kind of pull back and remember that when you send a box of chocolates, there has to be familiarity in that box for people. Something they can, they know what they're putting in their mouth. Well, what's the best thing in your case right now? What do you think? Oh, gosh. There's what's a few. Don't no, no, forget, though, what's the best. What's your favorite? Like, what's the thing that, that like, when you, when you do the, I got to make sure that's okay. 
I got to try that to make sure it's okay. Well, you know, it's Which funny. After it? this many years, people mostly eat fevs. Um, so they can eat whatever they want, including myself. But we usually eat fevs. The one that I always go back to, and I, I can't claim that it's great. I love the peanut butter and jelly because it's just so nostalgic for me. Um, there's there's something about, you know, and, and then the other one, another one is the dolce de leche, which is a process that, you know, Valrona taught with roasted white chocolate. I just think that's got a, a flavor. I always tell people this is white chocolate and they can't believe, they don't believe it. And so I'm, I'm, it's not so much that we made it great. I just, I'm, I'm really uh, intrigued by the, uh, the, the process that that came about. Yeah. Like I'll be honest. So we did it full disclosure again. We did a trial on some equipment for Bill and um, he sent us a bunch of his caramel and uh, we, we ran caramel. We ran a lot of caramel. Like we ran a lot for us. I mean, we would ran, for you, it would be like two days worth of sales. But um, there's still a tray of it over there. Oh. Like I'll still like walk by and grab two or three of them. I like just. Oh, like, you like that one? Yeah. So and, and the yeah. other thing I've been eating. By the way, Bill did send us a whole goodie bag. The other thing that I've eaten like most of, and the first that I put it in my mouth at first, I was like, "Meh, it's okay." And I've eaten the whole bag in two days, and I've eaten the whole bag. Nobody else has helped me with this. I eat it, and I had to put it's it on the bottom shelf because I was eating it, waiting for you to get on board today, and I was going to not, I was going to It has a secret ingredient. Well, uh, um, when I did do home shopping, they all said the same thing. Does it have crack in it? And it's actually a St Stefan Glossier hard nougat recipe. I made it. Nobody here would eat hard nougat, so I started playing around with it to, and turn it into popcorn and took out, car you know, he had uh, um, coriander, which nobody here will eat. But it has a lot of real honey and vanilla beans, and that you know that's why it tastes good. The flavors, it's the ingredient. Quality ingredients, quality yep. process, good products. Right. Yep. Okay. Yep. So it's Christmas time. You've been working at the shop like fourteen hours today. You like you you realize you haven't had lunch, so you swing into the Seven Eleven. Are the Seven Elevens in Florida? I don't know. Uh -huh. So you swing into the Seven Eleven to grab a big bite a bottle of water and you're when you're headed back like look the sales team's now complaining that i hoarded all of your goodies by the way so i got to take them over so you, you got you got the big bite you got the bottle of water you're in the confection aisle the mass market confection aisle sure and you only get one item what do you buy there's only one bar i ever buy and i don't do it that often but sometimes i have a hankering if i'm in a movie theater i'll get M peanut m ms because I don't care that we can pan. I just do like toss, them. Do you toss them in the popcorn? No, I don't. That's a good idea, though. You toss them in the I'm popcorn. I'm very weird. With, so people are different. So I'm one of those people, if you if we have dinner together or lunch, you'll notice I finish one section before I go to the next. I just can't mix. But I, I've i heard this question, so I'm prepared. There's only you have little plates? Do you have, like, plates at home? No, no. I mean, they can food? touch. They can touch, and I don't need medication. But I just feel like... I, I like to finish one thing before I go to another. And then I see, uh, I'll eat with people and everything shepherd's pie. They just move it all together and I just don't get it. But that's just me. But I knew this question, so I came prepared. This is the one bar I'll buy if I buy a bar. It's not high end or anything, but. The payday. But that's, you are the first person in chocolate to your chat to answer payday. I like the, the, the peanuts, the salt, and, you know, I'm not going to care about the quality of the nougat, but. Um, it, it may be once, once or twice a month, but I just, it makes me think of when I was a child. I think that's probably it, the nostalgia tied to it. Um, when you asked this question to somebody else, I, I thought, well, I used to get zero bars when I was a kid. So I actually went and bought a zero bar and I thought I'll never eat another one. Uh, they were, they were better when you're young. <laughs> All right, so Bill, we're wrapping up. We're out of time. Okay. I, didn't get to, I didn't get to hear your semi-pro baseball story, so we'll save that for the next time. Okay. Hear. And um, so, hey, this is an original, by the way. I got this the last time I oh, was Oh, that's there. an old one. I know. Like, it's Smithsonian's so looking for that. Well, so I don't even away. have that one. Plug away. WilliamDeanChocolates.com, right? Yep. Yep. And, you know, our, in our, we, do, we, you know we, we do a lot of uh, internet business. I mean, honestly, we're not uh, a huge company, so shipping to the West Coast is a bit of a challenge. But uh, the one good thing about being in Florida – is we can ship anywhere in Florida and it's next day. So is though, although it's hot here, since most of our business is in the surrounding states, it works out pretty good with insulated packages. But uh, no, it's been, I mean, I, I view again, I, I should have said Tom Rick since day one, literally day one has been a big part of this business. And 
Uh, I should have taken a picture of the kitchen because it's basically a, a sell me showroom about to be more, I think. That's what I heard. Uh -huh. All right. So, Bill, thank you very much. So, WilliamDeanChocolates.com, online, Facebook, all that good stuff. Uh, and, Bill, thanks a bunch. Hey, thanks, Brian. I appreciate it. It's always fun to catch up. All right. Talk to you soon. All Bye. right. Take care. Oh, Elliot. <laughs> Bye.